This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. I'm Annie. Um, I am a designer, but I'm going to try to talk to you about stuff um, beyond Um, so, I'm going to talk about some strategy for better WordPress sites, or really I'm going to talk about all these things all together and how they overlap, and how knowing a little bit about each of them can make your sites infinitely better and more professional. So. All of these things, design, user experience, content strategy, and SEO are really big areas of knowledge and there are experts in every single one who that's all they do. Um, but there are little bits you can take from each in terms of techniques, in terms of just getting it, and um, in terms of little tricks that can make your sites a lot better. Do I need to echo like this? <laughs> Um, so, beyond just talking about those four things, which are huge topics, I'm going to talk about four things about each of those four things. So that's 16 things. So don't ask me how I can talk about 16 things in however many minutes, but I'm going to try. Um, these are my favorite big ideas about, really about design, that apply to also to UX, also to content strategy, and also to SEO. Hierarchy is, um, sounds boring, but it's a really good friend of mine. It really helps you make things better. Clarity is pretty obvious. Branding is what I do in my day job, so I think it's important. And your audience is also important. So I'm going to talk about how each of these four things, a part of those four things, and how it all can be gussied up with WordPress. So, definitions. And you know, if any of this is too basic, just bear with me. And if it's too unbasic, just raise your hand and ask me what the hell I'm talking about. Um, so, design. You kind of know it when you see it. Really everything um, in the man-made world is design. There's some design decision went into everything. Sometimes there are bad decisions. Sometimes they weren't very strategic decisions, but everything out there was designed. Um, and what I like to think of as the real definition of design is it's the visual organization which helps you to understand things, um, or to use things, or to relate or interface with things. Um, design can also be the aesthetic appeal or aesthetic non-appeal of something. So, you know, like like pornography, you know when you see it, good design. So loosely, here's a random example of a well-designed site. It's got um, some branding. It tells you where you are. It's up in the corner there where it usually is on websites, so it's following a common design pattern that helps you to know, oh, this is the logo for this website. Um, the more important information is bigger and it's a brighter color. There's some smaller type that is less important information, more details. And there's even smaller gray type, that's the nitty gritty details that you only need to know about if you really care. Um, there's some breadcrumbs to help you know where you are. There's lots of white space, so the things that are important stand out. You see water bottles, get it. <laughs> and there's some nice little pops of color that um, enliven the page, which is otherwise sort of the brand colors of this company. Bad design. <laughs> So this site is in, I think, Danish, but I think you can understand why it's not so um, 
awesome. <laughs> so weird things like the visitor counter are right at the top in the middle. There's menus and content are hard to distinguish, even if you speak Danish, I'd imagine. I don't know if any of you speak Danish, but. Um, and all, all the fonts are sort of the same size, the same weight. Um, they're, things are different colors, but not for any apparent reason. It doesn't aid in the, the uh, visual organization. Um, some of those things might be categories, but some of those things might not be categories. Um, this doesn't really follow any expected design paradigm, so you're, you're not aided in using what you already know to be able to navigate this page. Um, it breaks every sort of convention you may have encountered. And indexes up here three times, I think because it's important, they thought maybe if they repeated it, that would make it easier to find. Um, and apparently you can buy a portable inflatable hovercraft for one person, which I think should be bigger and more prominent because it's very important, but it's uh, just buried, which is, I think, very sad. So user experience, what is that? Um, some people uh, call it human, human computer interaction. It's a whole science. It's, it's deep and interesting and has years of research in it. Um, but in practical terms, it's how people move through your site. It's the information architecture, it's the structure of your pages, it's how literally the human interacts with the computer. Um, and it's the feeling that these interactions evoke, which I think is kind of overlooked and really important. It's not just about the technical, oh, research shows that people read the page in this form, so we should put things in that order. How does it make them feel when they're using it? Um, is it friendly? Is it difficult? Are you a really techie company with a really overly simplistic site? Maybe that's not right. Are you a really, are you uh, a company that makes things simple for people, but your site is overly techy and hard to deal with? Maybe that's not right. So UX can be, <laughs> it's more than science. It's, it's an art and, and an emotional thing as well, I think. So content strategy. This, is, this bucket is the, probably the least understood of all of them because it's something that basically um, Christina Alverson made up a word for a few years ago. This is her book, it's the seminal work on this topic, so if you're interested. Um, she and other um, content strategists argue that there's information architecture, there's wireframes, there's sitemaps, there's all kinds of planning that goes into a website, but there needs to be one person or a team of people who who wrangle it and who understand the content strategy. The, um, not only what content you need, which they figure out through assessing um, needs and analyzing what already exists and how it can be repurposed and used for a new website, but also um, how that's gonna live into the future. They call it governance, but really it's who's in charge of content, um, who's in charge of creating it originally, who's in charge of updating it in the future. This is really important when you have a site with a CMS and you're more than one person. <laughs> um, you know, it might be a very complicated structure with a committee or a team or different stakeholders and different authors and very few companies really need that strategy to start out and that leads to sites that are not up to date, that are have 10 different voices but not on purpose and are generally disorganized and don't follow schedules. So that's the idea of governance and content strategy. And then there's the actual making the content which can be, um, it's, it's the word smithing. So there's macro copy which is what you think of as content, all that text on your website, the blog entries, the pages, the, the blah, blah, blah. 
um, the pictures and the documents and the other downloads and the videos and all that stuff. And then there's a micro copy. And that's a fancy way of saying basically the stuff that says on the buttons and on the nav and, um, and the little tiny bits that when you're assigning someone to write a page, you forget to tell them and then somebody has to come up with that and then who is it? So that's what content strategists do, plan that. But that's, that microcopy stuff is actually important. If you do, um, people have done studies on you know, whether it should say on that button, it should say sign up now or join now or be our best friend forever or you know anything else and there's differences in how many people will click the button based on what it says just those few little words whether it says submit or email us or whether it says um, you know about us or <laughs> like our crazy quasi mythical backstory like there's a difference and those things should be accounted for and planned for and I mean, I know in my practice when I um, when I have a client who's generating the content for their site rather than a copywriter or a content strategist, I'm very careful to make them a what I call a content matrix, which is a fancy way of saying an Excel document that lists every page, and not just that I need some copy to go there, but that I need some copy and I need an introduction to their email form and I need what it says on the button and I need what it says in the sidebar or you, know, you sign up for the newsletter. And it really helps to make the website um, have a cohesive voice. And it also helps not necessarily having the designer write those bits of copy. Some designers are good writers, but some designers you know, don't care. Or, <laughs> or um, you know, it's not their job. So content strategy. And the last thing, um, SEO, you probably know what SEO is, but basically it's like we want to be on the top on Google. Um, and it's also how you show up in search engines so that people want to click on that link. Um, not just that you get there, but that it works. And in terms of this talk, I'm talking about organic search or unpaid rankings, I'm not talking about search engine marketing or AdWords or any of those things, so that's pretty different. Um, so let's talk about pirate. That's my favorite. So probably the most important concept in this whole talk is about hierarchy and design, and I kind of harp on it because I think it's, it's, it's obvious, but it's really important. Um, and all it really means is <laughs> that the most prominent stuff is the most obvious in the design. Um, and that like things are equivalent to each other. So if you think about the design of a site, you often have a head, a big thing. That should be the most important information you want to convey to your audience. Sounds stupid, but if you don't stop and think about it, some weird things can end up there. And um, we often have buckets. And the things that go in those buckets should be equivalent. They, if they're designed the same way, they should have the same level of importance and the same, they should be a sort of equivalent choice for the user. Um, you know, do I want to choose to read about this service, this service, or this service? Not do I want to choose to read about this service or the most apocalyptic thing that's ever going to happen in the history of the universe or um, a piece of dirt. You know, it, they need to be equivalent choices. And a lot of design is just about sorting those things out and then making them look that way. Um, so literally, when you're planning your website, think about what's the most important thing you want to convey. And then look at either the theme you've, you know, you've chosen that somebody else designed or the theme you're designing or the theme someone's helping you design and make that thing the most visually prominent. What's the second most important thing? make that second most visually prominent. Um, it's actually worth going through the exercise of sort of codifying those ideas <laughs> um, so that you know when you're designing. And that's kind of why designers make um, wireframes, why designers make wireframes as opposed to why tech people make wireframes. Because we know in a wireframe, which is just a sort of schematic diagram of 
all the stuff that needs to be on a given page. Um, that there's, you know, there's a marketing blur, really important. Usually at my wireframes, that's pretty big. Um, privacy terms, really unimportant. On my wireframes, that's usually pretty small and at the bottom. Even though that's not how the site's gonna look, and maybe the marketing blurb isn't over here and the privacy is over here, but the wireframes have them up and down. It gives me an indication of how I'm going to um, design those things hierarchically. How exactly they look is a different decision that will come later, but it's really helpful to have that map when you're starting out. So here, this is like design school in five seconds. Um, this is a bunch of ways to create visual hierarchy. And I know not everyone here is a designer or is going to design a theme from scratch or anything like that. But think about this when you're shopping for themes that already exist. See how well the, the designers did with these things to see if it's going to be a good um, theme for you to use. So proportion, we notice big things. So if something's important, big. If it's not important, small. Um, and it can actually, you notice a big thing, even if it's not on top. So proportion can override position. Position, obviously, where things are on the page. Um, you can Google the studies that show how people look at web pages. There's been a lot, of, there's a lot of heat maps out there. It's kind of an F pattern. Um, you've probably seen that. So bear that in mind in terms of the hierarchy. Where are people looking first? Maybe that's where the most important thing should go. Um, and also know that people look at websites really quickly. So you might want to use that, you know, that first place it might be the only chance you get. Um, actually read a statistic that I don't have a good um, reference for, but that people make a judgment on the credibility of your brand within 1 20th of a second of getting to your website. So you don't have much chance to make a good first impression. <laughs> um, proximity, how close things are to each other. It's really about the visual relationships. Um, it's often misused in that, like if you have a, a caption for a photo, it needs to be relatively closer to that photo than it is to other things. If you have you know, labels for any given item. They need to live with that thing, not be halfway between that thing and the next thing. Um, and it can really help to um, to bring understanding to the page, even though it's just really simple. Like, put things that go together close together. <laughs> um, um, symmetry, our eyes really want things to be symmetrical. It's just enculturated or I don't know, maybe we're born that way or I don't know, but we want things to be symmetrical. So you can use that to your advantage by making things symmetrical that you want to be pleasy, pleasing and easy to deal with and satisfying and resolved like, like music that ends on that correct note. Um, but you can also break symmetry in order to make something surprising or make something stand out. You know, maybe you have a grid and there's something that's off to the side. Well, you're going to notice that because your eye wants it to resolve. Um, alignment. There's a whole, um, a whole world of thinking of the, what we call grid systems. And um, there's, you know, uh, proportions and it goes all the way back to, you know, the golden ratio and there's all kinds of different kinds of grid systems and ways to align things, but I think the long and the short of it is line things up, unless there's a good reason not to. It makes everything less cluttered, like that, that Danish hovercraft website. Some boxes were lined up, and some boxes were all over the place, and it was upsetting. Um, but if it were just a regular grid, it'd still probably be upsetting, but it would be less upsetting. Um, and contrast is not just in colors, though that's important, but also, you know, any of these other uh, qualities, big and small, um, color, 
light and dark, any of these things, use contrast to your advantage. It makes things stand out. Similarity makes things feel of a kind and equivalent, and contrast makes things stand out or receive. Um, color is pretty obvious, but um, in general, you can, um, let me just say this the right way. <laughs> so warm colors stand out and cold colors recede. This is, this is like painting color theory 101, which I've forgotten, but I wrote it down. Um, and so you can use that to your advantage as well when you're creating a hierarchy. Um, you know, when you have those little stickers that say sale and they're bright orange, you see those um, versus something that's a cool gray or a light blue is going to receive and not be as prominent. So choose your color based on what the effect you want. And colors also obviously have different associations in different markets, in different um, businesses. You know, in some niches, everyone's blue. And if you're orange, you're going to stand out. But maybe you don't want to stand out, so you're blue too. Um, and colors have different associations culturally. You know, red means one thing here and one thing in China and one thing in Russia. And every color <coughs> changes as you move around the world. So if you're working with um, localized sites and different for different audiences, that's something to bear in mind. Um, finally, is space or, or the pregnant pause. Um, white space is a kind of obvious design thing. Um, the less visual clutter, the more things are going to stand out that you want to stand out. It also just, I think it boosts the um, sort of sophistication and professionalness of a design pretty quickly. If you use sp uh, white space or just space without things in it, it doesn't have to be white, just that negative space judiciously. Um, there's a woman named Liz Danzico who uh, writes about content strategy and such things, I mean, the user experience. And she has some really nice writing on the concept of pause, um, not just visually, but in terms of talking, in terms of writing, in terms of life. Right. So Google that if you, if you like white space. What was her name? Liz Danzico. Her uh, blog is called Bobulate, as in discombobulate, but without this call. <laughs> Can you spell her last name? Uh, D-A-N-Z-I-C-O, I believe. So when you're when you're out shopping for <laughs> WordPress themes, be they free or not free, um, one thing that can really help you evaluate all that stuff I just talked about is to plug in a whole mess of sample content. Um, when you're just looking through the theme store on WordPress, uh, .org or you're you know, looking at people's sites and looking at the previews, usually the previews look kind of screwed up or even if they don't look screwed up, they don't have enough stuff for you to really tell how it's going to work in the real world. If you haven't magically written your entire site before you go through the process of choosing a theme, it's really hard to guess. And I know I've you know, installed a gazillion themes and looked at them one by one before. So here, this little trick, um, there's on this site there, <coughs> you can download an XML file that has lots and lots of posts in it that contain lots and lots of styles. Um, and in order to do this, you go to the site, you download this file for free, and then you go in your WordPress installation to import and there's um, a page there called import, and the kind of import you want to do is WordPress. And when you choose that, it lets you upload that file you just downloaded. And this will automatically, immediately populate your site with all these sample posts. Um, and they have really great things like heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, block code. So you can see what all the different kinds of um, content are going to look like without having to fake it yourself. And it's a great way to tell, like right off the bat, does this design have good hierarchies in it? And is it going to feel right for me once I write all this stuff? Um, 
also when you are working on your site. Yeah. Um, so when you're working on your site, there's in the just in the normal content editor, you change the styles of things with this drop down here. Um, if you're not seeing that drop down, it's because WordPress for some reason likes to close up the menu to one level. But if you click that thing that looks like little spots in a paint box, which is called the kitchen thing, it opens the second line of options. So once you have the second line of options, there's your styling menu. And you really want to style every piece of content that you have. Um, if it just says, I think, format is the default, if something isn't styled, it's going to just end up looking really random on your site, probably all smushed together or in courier or something that you don't, that's not intentional. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about like what these things are. Um, when we talk about SEO, but basically by just choosing a style and being consistent about that, whenever you put content on your site, you automatically create visual hierarchies with the typography, assuming that you've chosen a theme where that's um, set up well. And it's also going to have other benefits um, for SEO, which we'll talk about. And if you find that what you're choosing styles arbitrarily, like sometimes it's a heading two and sometimes it's a heading three and sometimes it's a quote and you're not really sure, make yourself a style guide. Um, just note what's the circumstance in which it should be a heading two. It's, you know, uh, it's when I name my uh, article, it's a heading H2, a heading two. Or when it's a subhead within my text, it's a heading two. Just make that decision and then stick to it. It doesn't really matter totally what the decision is, as long as you're consistent, it will make things look a lot better. So hierarchy in, in UX. Um, really the only, the most important thing here is when people get to your site, what's their question? What do they want to know? That's the primary thing you want to answer in your hierarchy of user experience. What do they want? So. I'll show you a sample on the site. Here's um, the home page of the MailChimp site. What do you, where am I? MailChimp, it's pretty odd. Um, what's this place like? Well, there's a giant smiling monkey. It's probably pretty friendly. Um, what can I get? Easy email newsletters. That's really big type. I know what they have. Um, what should I do? Sign up free. And if I didn't see that, it's up there again. Um, so for a user experience that isn't frustrating, think about those questions. What are people asking when they get to your site? And then answer them in a way that's really easy for them to deal with without thinking. Um, that's, that's how I think about the hierarchy of user experience. I mean, there's a lot more to it. There's how you construct the entire information architecture of your site and what path people move through when they're navigating. and how you get from the home page to whatever your conversion goal is for them. Um, like, you know, ultimately you want people to buy something, or ultimately you want people to call you, or ultimately you want people to fill out a form. Then there's a certain order in which their user experience should flow, ideally, and that's a consideration. But the, the most basic level, what's the question, and how can you answer it really obviously? In, when you're thinking about content strategy, I think in the hierarchy category, um, first of all, it's as much as you want to talk about when your company was founded or what you do or, um, you know, we're founded on the basic underlying principle of blah, 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 blah. It's really not about you. It's, what, it's about your users and why they come to the site and how you can help them and what's in it for them. So I think in that hierarchy, you want to answer that question first. What's in it for me from the user's perspective, not from your perspective? Sure, you might want them to ultimately do something like I just mentioned, like sign up for your email newsletter or something. But 
ultimately first answer what's in it for me and don't hassle them <laughs> with pop-ups and this and that and what you want them to do and what you're all about. Um, they'll get to that if they really want to know. If they really want to know what year you're founded, they will drill down in that about us section until they find it. But mostly they don't. They want to know what you can do for them, maybe how much it costs, where you are, what is it, um, or you know, do I like this blog, and who wrote it, when did they write it, um, who are they, what are their credentials. <laughs> Hierarchy is really important in SEO because those headings that I was talking about in your content actually translate in the code to help you get ranked by search engines. Um, search engines know that anything you make a heading one is really important. Anything you make a heading two is second most important and so forth. So you should definitely use those um, when you're writing when you're writing. But also think about it from the perspective of how you want to show up um, in Google or wherever. Um, they, I mean, SEO is a big, a big story, but think about what those words are that people um, might search for you with and try to incorporate those into your higher level things. Um, not in a way that's obnoxious or fake, in a way that's authentic, as they say. Um, you know, always write for humans, not for computers. But think about the fact that SEO is also a hierarchy. Um, H1s are ranked more important than H2s and so forth. And also think about when you're building your site, what, um, what pages are at the top level versus sub pages. Um, those are gonna be, I mean, not only for robots, but for users, you wanna be able to find the most important stuff first. Let's talk about clarity. Um, so again, white space is your friend. That's gonna add to clarity and keep the design hierarchy principles handy. Um, and again, same thing with user experience. Make it really obvious what users should do and in what order if that's important. Might not be. For writing content, um, you should use language at the simplest appropriate level. So newspapers are supposedly written for a sixth grade level. Um, I design some books for audiences that English is their second language and they don't read well because they're in impoverished areas of um, countries like Haiti or Rwanda. Those are way below a sixth grade level. Um, but technical journals or literary novels are way above a sixth grade level. It's making a conscious decision when you um, are creating your content. And there's, there's tools out there that can sort of test it for you. Um, reading level tool, tester tools. I'm not sure if those are super valid, but I think it's an interesting part of the content strategy. Where is clarity gonna be for your audience? Is it you know, this, at the same level as a newspaper, is it the same level as a literary novel? I don't know. Um, I think you've probably all heard people don't read on the web. It's sort of true. Um, people scan a lot when they're looking at web pages. And so I always say it's important to chunk it, which I define as use a lot of headings, um, break up your pages visually so that people can scan and find parts that interest them with a nice heading or use bullets or keep your paragraphs relatively short. Um, I really like big huge words and Victorian phraseology and stuff but it's really not going to make a lot of people happy reading on the web so unless you have a very specific use case probably keep it simple. Um, and call things what they are. Um, again, like if you're naming your navigation and you call a button something that's really cute and really clever, but it's totally weird, 
No one's ever going to click on it, or only a few people will. And people are going to get frustrated and they're going to bounce off your site. Um, even though About Us is a really boring thing to have to put on a button or a navigation, it's probably uh, going to help people find the About Us section. Whereas, um, you know, crazy story we made up that's somewhat biographical is not. Only a few people are going to click on it. Um, and then also you can test different wording, or especially in the micro copy, you can, um, Google offers tools for A-B testing, which let you serve out different versions of the same page and see the results. Um, it's part of the Google Analytics stuff, if you dig in there. Um, so if you're not sure about, you know, whether people are gonna respond to join us or sign up now or be my best friend, um, test it. It's, you don't need a huge volume to start to see um, where the preferences lie. And there's also, people do studies about what microcopy sells better or, or leads to more conversions. It's really interesting stuff. So if you have a specific issue you're grappling with, maybe somebody's already tested it. Um, I think they're, like HubSpot does a lot of that, and there's a guy up in Newburyport whose name is Josh Porter, who um, also has written on some really interesting stuff about tiny, tiny variations of microcopy and how it affects conversion rates. Um, even things like I heard that <laughs> I heard Google tested 32 different shades of blue when they um, <laughs> chose what blue to use on their a really fancy Google homepage. Um, and there was one that, you know, statistically did better. So you can test anything. Um, you might not want to get too crazy about it, though. Um, but SEO, again, kind of obvious, but choose what keywords you want to focus on and then focus on them. Um, I kind of think people are always like, yeah, I know what my keywords are. It's obvious. But actually sit down and write a list what you think people are going to search for to find you and then focus on, and then keep that list handy to remind yourself and then when you're writing your copy or you're um, tweaking your keywords which I'll show you in a second um, actually use those because having a gazillion different keywords you uh, focus on isn't going to work as well as having a few that are really super relevant and that you use consistently. Um, and when I say keep the metaphors in check, this is something I found myself doing that I think that I kind of learned my lesson from. A lot of times when you're titling something, especially like a blog post, um, it's really tempting to call it something clever but not illustrative. Um, and uh, like, Okay, so say you're writing a blog for people who do uh, social media and are into self-help or pop psychology or something, and you call your, so you write a post called All You Need Is Love, and it's about blog comments and how they make you feel good. Well, All You Need Is Love isn't going to rank for anything in Google, um, except the Beatles song and, you know, other irrelevant things. It's not going to help you come up. So maybe you need to call it all you need is love, colon, self-esteem and blog comments. Self-esteem is a relevant keyword for you. Blog comments is a relevant keyword for you. That will work better. Maybe put that first. It might not be as cute and clever. Um, but it's, a re it's really hard to remember to, to uh, keep it real and unmetaphorical, especially when you're of a literary bent and you want to be smart and not write for search engines. So there's a compromise there, but I'll always write for humans, but remember the robots too. Um, and then the other um, tip that's gonna help with WordPress SEO is to change your permalink structure, which I'll also show you quickly. So. Okay, so for, for actually doing all those, a lot of those things I just said, um, there's a pretty easy way to There's a really great plugin called, this is called WordPress SEO. It's um, the Yoast one. And 
there's another one that I've used called um, SEO Platinum Pack, also very good. This one has a few more options, it's a little more robust. Um, SEO isn't, you know, my, my uh, daily bread, so I can't, yeah. So just to add to that Yoast one, I think he's working on an algorithm where it will actually track where your reader is on the page to see oh, if they're oh. actually reading your content. Cool. Yeah, this one has a lot of neat features. Like you can use it in a really simple way, but you can also get really deep into it and tweak all kinds of stuff. What was the second one? Um, it's called uh, SEO Platinum Pack, and these are both free. And in the you know, if you search for plugins from WordPress, you'll find them. Um, and with either of these, or just in general, I would recommend having Google Analytics installed on your site. And there's a nice plugin called Google Analyticator that will let you access some of those um, statistics right from your dashboard for a quick picture. And then you can click through to the actual Google Analytics site and see all the gory details. Um, and I mean, basically, when you're when you're trying to improve your SEO, it's really hard to know what to do unless you're also looking at your analytics. It goes hand in hand. So I, I find this is a nice little combination that's totally code-free, um, happy, easy, um, GUI-based way to do it. So this is um, when you install the uh, WordPress SEO plugin. For every page or post, you get this extra dialog box, like right under the place where you write. And first it shows you what you're going to look like when you show up in Google for that page. Um, and then it lets you tweak your title of your page and your keywords and your description all right there just by typing stuff in these boxes. You don't have to go in the code or do anything. You can change it as often as you want. You can see what's been ranking using Google Analyticator and then tweak accordingly. So. And then it also, obviously, it helps you with little tips and you can find related keywords and stuff. Um, there's also a whole host of other options. This is the basics. This is probably what most people need who aren't running seriously SEO um, dependent businesses. Like if you're not running a store, you're not running um, something where you live and die by people finding you through organic search. I think this just Keeping up on this would be a great way to keep your blog in, or your site as as findable as it needs to be. Um, the other thing is to change the permalink structure, and you might you might already know this, but um, this means that the URLs at the top of your pages, instead of saying dash p uh, dot like dot what is it? blah, blah, gobbledygook, number, PHP. Um, they actually say words that are in the title of the page the way you wrote it. So you'll get um, you know, your site name slash post about dogs dot PHP, which will help it show up in search engines, help people be able to understand where they are. Very good for SEO, very happy, very friendly. Um, so how you make this happen, it's not set up this way by default. You go to, um, in settings, there's a, a tab called permalinks, and you choose the custom structure option, and you type in that thing there, post name with percentage signs around it. And I think actually the um, that SEO plugin will do this for you. Um, if you don't want to take the three seconds, it will do it on your own. So that's cool. Okay, let's talk about brand. So, oh, yeah. Just an SEO question? Yeah. Are there any plugins that do any link building? Mm, I don't know any off the top of my head. Anyone else know any? Is it link building? Would you do any what? Do any what? <clears throat> Help with link building? No, like off page SEO? Like, you more like encourage other people to put links on their site or? Right. Right. So, you know, just to. I'm not sure how a plugin would do that. Yeah, you know, it just makes the process easier, I guess. Because mm -hmm. all, all the SEO plugins are about called on page. Yeah. Well, I mean, in maybe an old fashioned, but I think that kind of stuff is about relationship building. Like, you actually have to know those site owners, and they have to have a reason to link to you. Mm -hmm. 
or the maybe your their directory that you can submit to but i don't i think automating it generally starts to stray into the territory of bad idea black hat mm. <laughs> so i mean you, you can link it to your twitter and facebook accounts yeah social media okay yeah um So, totally changing the topic. Um, I talk about branding in terms of design. Um, there's sort of obvious stuff like what your site looks like and what color it is and what typefaces you use and um, how are photos treated and what kind of other stuff do you have on there and what's it look like. And um, that's all important. And as a designer, I, I like that stuff. But. I think really branding is about what kind of emotion your 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 site or your company or your whatever the whatever you're doing what it evokes, um, and I put my little thing here in red that um, even though I design logos for a living, it's not your brand. Your brand is how people think about you, and you can't really control that. Um, you can maybe influence it. You can maybe hope to control it, but really it's. Um, it's how people perceive you and the best way to control it, I think, is to A, be cool and have a good good thing going, a good company, a good blog, a good brand, uh, whatever, whatever it is. And then um, make those visuals and the way you act and the things you do consistent over time and um, make them appealing. And I think the, that combination is the best and only way really to influence brand. Um, and you still might fail. I mean, people still, you know, might write really mean stories about you on their blogs or in the press and um, it's a problem. But in terms of what you can control, what emotion do you want to evoke in people? What reaction? Um, are you you know, the blue square that says Goldman Sachs? Are you the blue square that says Facebook? Are you the blue square that says Twitter? Um, what kind of meaning does your blue square have? Um, and it's kind of, uh, again, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious, but it's an exercise worth doing. When you start to think about how your, your company's site should look or the site you're creating for another company, what are the five adjectives that describe that brand perception you're going for? Like actually go through the process of writing them down and then tag everything back to that. Um, with my clients, I, actually, I go through this card sorting exercise where they, there's literally index cards that have a gazillion adjectives and I make the team decide on five that they want to focus on and there's usually big fights and stuff. And, getting down to five is hard. And it brings out, I mean, if you're a team of more than one person, it's really interesting to do this because you find out that somebody on the team thinks you're the cool hip company and somebody on the team thinks you're the sophisticated cool company. And then you decide what those two things mean until you come to a consensus. And then you know what maybe it should look like. Um, and you know what kind of words to use on the site and what kind of reading level to use and what kind of um, user experience would be appropriate for the emotion you want to evoke. Um, so yeah, literally, like write down the adjectives and then winnow them down to just a few. Um, and then when you're shopping for a theme, think about, you know, what, like, take note of how, what your initial reaction is to that look. Does it feel the same as those adjectives or some of them? Maybe it, it's not going to work to get a you know, pre-made thing. Maybe you need someone to design it for you, or maybe you need to tweak something that exists. Maybe you need to work with a framework. That's the kind of thing that, I mean, you have a lot of options when you're making sites with WordPress. And sometimes the easy way isn't always the best way if you want to really be true to your brand, which I think in the end is going to take you further than making do with something that you know, it's kind of like, right, but not really. Um, again, it's when um, people interact with your site, is it on brand? 
is it um, if you okay think about the staples website they make things easy right they have the big red button how easy is it to find things on the staples site mm, it's okay if you use search but is that really easy I don't know um, but then you know there's other sites where things are really easy to find. I'm trying to think of a good, a good example. Um, but are you, are you a um, easy to deal with company, or are you like really deeply technical, and your your users are so smart that they're okay with drilling down because they know that there's a gazillion billion layers of information and it's worth it to them to get there. I think about this in terms of like um, I think that a lot of uh, sites like HP or other places where there's manuals for things, think their users are like that, but they're not. Um, they don't actually want to spend 20 minutes finding the manual for their printer. They want it to be easy. But HP is a technology company, so. Um, when you think about brand in terms of SEO, um, don't try to game the system because you kind of look like a joke when you use all kinds of crazy keywords that don't really apply to you. In the end, it's not going to really work to, um, you know, list every town in Massachusetts on your website. Um, and really focusing on those the keywords that are key to your brand that are that do support your mission or those five adjectives you came up with or your brand values is really gonna get people to sort of self-select. It's the people who are searching for those things that you really represent who are gonna end up at your site and then you're gonna have better relationships because you're more made for each other. Um, so audience, this is the last thing in the grid. Um, when you're thinking about design, you might have heard of this idea of building personas and again, it's one of these exercises that sounds kind of dopey and sounds really obvious. And people are like, I know who my audience is. I totally know who my audience is. But if you actually stop and think about it and codify it and write it down and share the, share the thinking about it with your whole team and maybe some customers or clients or other kinds of stakeholders in your website or readers if it's a blog or um, Whoever, whoever has a say in things, you're gonna come up with better information and then you're gonna be able to design better. So the idea of personas is you create an imaginary user, basically. And um, maybe there's several of them if you have different audience members, different audience types, and most people do. So maybe there's you know the, uh, the blog reader who comments, the blog reader who works, the blog reader who buys things from my you know, little store, or there's, you know, if you're a bigger company, maybe it's, um, you know, some demographic thing, like women 25 to 35, or college students, or um, dads who love lawnmowers, or whatever it is. Figure out who some, some sort of fake person or persona who represents a typical audience member, and then actually sort of write up a bio of them. Um, you know, some people put a, a picture, a stock photo of a fake person. Um, maybe give them a name or not, give them an age, give them some, an, you know, an income profile, give them anything that will help you to understand who they are. And the, the point of the exercise is to then try to see the site through their eyes once you kind of understand who they are. Um, and then think about what they want in the design. Um, a, a dad who loves lawnmowers and a 21-year-old female college student, different design aesthetics. So figure out who those people are and then figure out what they like. Um, and make the, make the visuals appropriate for the demographics. Um, you also want to obviously um, design for your audience if they're specialized in some way, be it you know, in a legal way, like the Americans with Disability Act, or they're um, under 13, um, or 
any other special case, you know, if you're working in government or anything, or um, legal or wealth management or anything like that, there's regulations. So there's design challenges there. Um, and then test your design. And you can, uh, you can do this super informally, and it's actually really informative to ask people what they think. I mean, there's a whole world of you know, agile development out there where users are very involved in the process. But even at the level of, do you like my site in blue versus do you like my site in green? Ask 10 friends and you'll get some interesting feedback and it will help you know which way to go. Um, and along those lines, this book, good description of informal user testing methods. And um, his other book is called Don't Make Me Think. It's kind of like a classic of uh, really uh, wonderfully, simply explained user experience stuff. Um, but user testing doesn't have to be fancy. It can be super informal. You can do it without building anything. You can do it with paper prototypes. You can do it with pictures of what it's going to look like. Um, you can do it with your existing site and say, hey, can you find, can you figure out, or you tell someone, um, you know, buy a widget, and then you watch them try to do it, see how hard or easy it is, and that informs what you do with your site next. Um, and again, user experience appropriate for the audience, be they 13 year olds or that we have 10 minutes left, or you're just giving me a high time. Okay. <laughs> um, again, keep your content appropriate to the audience once you know who they are, because you've made them, made them up. Um, you can also actually go out and do ethnographic research and really find out real stuff about your real audience, which is appropriate if you have the time and the budget and the manpower to do it. Um, I know my clients usually like to try to skip that, so that's why I like personas, because you can do it at home. Um, when you're um, using your Google Analyticator, um, obviously find out what people are searching for, and it might not be what you thought. Um, you know, you might, it's kind of more of that, it's not really about you stuff. Like you might think, okay, so our brands are really passionate, soulful landscape architects. So people are gonna be searching on passionate landscape architects. But no, they're searching on like Gardner Newton or something like that. So check out what people really are searching for. Um, again, it's their perception of you, not your own perception of you. And it might be a bummer though. It might be really cool to see what people are searching for too. Um, you can use the Google Keyword Research Tool. This is part of AdWords, which is the paid thing, but you can use this tool to find out um, different statistics about keyword popularity. It's very handy. Um, yeah, and think about your personas when you're doing your uh, keyword tweaking, too. You know, what, what's dad, one more dad searching for? What's the college student girl searching for? Um, it's really helpful to try to step out of your own brain sometimes. And summarily, um, in general, simple and appropriate is way better than complex and whiz bang. Um, upfront planning and consistency over time are what are going to make your sites look more professional and make your brand stronger and make things work better in general. Um, and obviously, because it's what I've just been talking about for a really long time, design, user experience, content strategy, and SEO all benefit from keeping things hierarchical, clear, on brand, and user focused. And that's where me and my slides live. That's it. Questions? Yeah. Or 
of, of email what? Email sign up on the, the website. Um, well, my first, my, my gut reaction is that the ones where it's a pop up, I hate. Um, there might be times when that's appropriate, but I think that falls under the rubric of bamboozling your users in a bad way. Um, but other than that, I think it really depends on the site design and the purpose. Like, how important is it for users to sign up? Is that the most important thing you want them to do? Maybe it's on every page then. Maybe it's at the top of the sidebar. Is it sort of kind of nice? Maybe it's in the footer. Um, it's really, again, it's like you have to go through that whole process of who do you want to sign up, under what circumstances, and relatively, how important is that compared to them getting the main message of the site or doing something else on the site? So it, it's kind of a horrible it depends answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you have any recommendations when you're working with your customers to determine, you know, help them that you're letting them know, I need this kind of content, and, but you're also understanding what kind of content they want to get out, like balancing those two things? Um, what do you mean what kind of content they want to get out? Well, they obviously, you know, they want to get a message across or a product or whatever, but you want to also make sure that the stuff they're giving you is stuff that, you know, will be appropriate for the website and will be simple enough for people to read. It, do, do you have any recommendations how to like strike a balance between those two things or figure out? You know? Well, the facetious and easy answer is to make them work with a copywriter um, who specializes in web. But if, if your clients are definitely generating their content themselves, I think I like to give them literally this content matrix that not only says what, a, what the requirements are for the page in terms of like I need, um, you know, two paragraphs about this, but I also have a notes field on that matrix that talks about the tone it should take. If I feel like my if that specific client isn't going to get it off the bat, or they they seem to be going in the wrong direction, like they're they're too much, they're too about us and not enough about the users. I I like to give them little hints in that last column, like. Like tell the users what the benefits are, or you know, list three things that will make people want to buy this, but not in a way that's really salesy. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. There's actually a, a new kind of web-based tool that kind of extracts content from clients in that format. Oh, um, it, it's gather kind of content. Gather content. Yeah. yeah. Like that in combination with like wireframing. Yeah, I haven't looked at that, but I saw it and I thought it looked very cool. People always explain or like explain. Getting content from clients is like herding cats. Yeah. That makes it not feel like herding cats. Yeah, I guess that's right. So I feed in here that there's this new tool called Gather Content, which I think is in beta still. It's, they just or, went public in here. It's free for a while. Okay, so it's free, no longer in beta. I've been using it for like a couple months. So. Mm. And it's, it's, it's like a, a structure to help you get the content from the clients. So just Google Gather Content, or is it actually a site that you go in? I think it's gathercontent.com. Yeah, that's the name of the tool. Yeah. Yes. Um, I often get asked about putting stuff on our site that um, the organization wants people to know about rather than what people are going to be looking for. Yeah. And so I actually don't know how to articulate why what they want is more important than what we want to tell them. So it's not enough. It's, it's a constant struggle. And what I, I usually try to do with my clients is try to help them to visualize being in the shoes of the user. Um, and it, it's, it's a little bit harsh, but like, does your user really? Okay, let me, re let me re frame that. Um, if you bring them back to the business objectives of the site, which are presumably to get work in some way, be it, you know, cotton weeds or selling things or whatever. Um, try to tie your your content strategy to that <coughs> business objective. So, so if you talk about what year you were founded, will that make people buy widgets? If you talk about how lives can be simplified with widgets, maybe that will help people buy them. So try to always tie it back to the business objective, and then. 
bury that blah, blah, blah a little deeper in the site, so it's still there, and people can find it if they want it, but it might not be the first thing I see. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.